Hey guys, Garrett here, and today I want to answer the question, is a geothermal system actually DIY? And if you're watching this video, it's probably because you watched one of my other videos where I said how cheap my DIY geothermal system was. So obviously the answer is yes, it can be DIY, but it has a steep, steep learning curve and you're gonna to have to know a lot of things to get it right. Do you need to be an HVAC tech to do it? No. Do you need to be an engineer like me to do it? No. Honestly, all of the information is out there. You just have to find it. And my goal for this video is to give you some of that information or at least give you a place to look for that information. I'm not going to design your system, so don't ask me to do it. Just not something I'm interested in. But you definitely have to be very confident in your skills. You have to take the time to actually learn as much as you possibly can about this. Read everything that you can, and it is possible to do it right. And if you're wondering why it's so expensive for contractors to do this, you have to remember the contractor has overhead. You're paying for their expertise. You're paying for their time, their equipment, their employees, as well as you know benefits, taxes, just everything that goes into it. It is expensive to own businesses. I own five businesses. Yes, it is very, very expensive to do it. And that unfortunately gets passed on to the end user, which is you who is buying this system. So I have nothing against them, but I like to try to do as much of this stuff as I possibly can myself and save those dollars. Plus, I really enjoy learning all of this stuff. And if you're like me, then this may be for you. But for the typical person or for most people, they're probably not going to want to put in all the time that it actually takes to do this. It's still a good Good thing to know uh, going into it what is involved with all of this so you can kind of check what your contractor is doing and don't always go for the low bid go for the great reputation and the excellent customer service as well as you got to remember they're giving you a warranty with this so since I did my stuff myself yes my unit has a warranty to it but uh, the installation doesn't because I did it when I'm talking about geothermal systems, I'm actually talking about a ground source heat pump. I'm not talking about air tubes or earth tubes, things like that, or an actual geothermal system which draws the heat from the earth's core. And they have you know, really, really deep wells and that sort of stuff where they superheat water and steam and then it turns turbines and all of that kind of stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about ground source heat pump, which most people market it as a geothermal heat pump. There's really only one type of uh, ground source heat pump system that I think is DIY and that would be a horizontal loop system. Vertical systems require very, very specialized equipment like well drilling and that sort of stuff. I would leave that to the pros to design that as well as install that. But the horizontal systems are definitely doable. And there are several different types of horizontal systems. There's a slinky type system of which I did as well as uh, you could just run it out really far and then run the, the line right back. Or you could put it into like a pond or a lake. But for the purposes of this video, all I'm talking about is the slinky type system or the, the horizontal type of system where you dig a big long trench and you lay your pipe in that. Yes, you can definitely put your loops in some sort of a body of water, but there's a lot that goes into that. And that's one of those things that I would probably have engineered by someone else. So where do you start with all of this? Honestly, you should really look at your own house uh, before you do it. This is a retrofit. All of your ductwork is already in. You're probably not going to be able to do much to modify it unless you tear out probably a lot of sheetrock, especially if you have a finished basement. Most likely it's in between the levels and you just can't get to it. But you should definitely first look at uh, tightening up your house, uh, caulk around the windows, replace the windows, add as much insulation as you can, figure out where air is getting out and air is getting in, as well as uh, areas that are just uninsulated. Make sure you get them insulated. Do as much as you can before you ever even think about getting into one of these systems. This should just be a part of the overall envelope. All right, let's say you're doing a retrofit into a house that has existing equipment. You're taking all of that equipment out. Most likely some sort of a heat load calculation was done 
at some point to determine the size of the units that you have. Of course, you can always do a new one and it's probably a good idea to do it, but as a general rule, you're probably gonna be okay using the same sized equipment that you're taking out, assuming that that equipment was actually able to keep up with the demands of the home. Well, if you're doing a new build, you're gonna have to do some sort of heat load calculation. Now, there's lots of them out there on the internet that are really shortcut things to do. And I would use any of those. Honestly, I just ran some of those on my computer for my own house and it was way, way off. So don't really use those. Do the actual calculation. And the best way to do that is with a whole house blower door test, which figures out the air tightness of your home and then take that information and input it into your manual J calculations. Now I have a link down below in my description for Manual J if that's something you want to do, you want to tackle that. It's a very, very technical book, so you're definitely going to want to take your time and get to know all of the terminology associated with it. But if you do it right, you're going to get a very accurate calculation for your heating and cooling loads. Now this is definitely something you can hire out and it's not a bad idea to do it. If this intimidates you, absolutely hire it out, either to a very reputable HVAC contractor or an engineering firm that specializes in something like this. So you're probably wondering, did I do all of this? And actually, no. This is kind of one of those things where you don't know what you don't know until you know it. Well, I have a bunch of HVAC guys that I work with because I have a bunch of rental units and every single rental unit has an HVAC in it. And we've changed out a zillion of them. So I consulted as much with them as I possibly could on this. And with that said, they kind of came back with, well, a typical house, it's again, a rule of thumb, which you shouldn't use, uh, is uh, 600 square feet per ton is what it's gonna be. And so the condition space in my house was 6,000 square feet, figured, okay, that's uh, 10 tons worth of unit. But I built an ICF house, which is a lot tighter and better insulated than what a typical house is. And the general rule is that you could downsize your units by 30 to 40%. So I went ahead and deducted 30% from it and did seven tons. Well, that meant that I had a three ton unit for all of my bedroom areas, which is exactly where I wanted. I wanted a, a, a two zone system. So bedrooms on one and the main living space on the other. And then I put a four ton unit on the main living space. And honestly, I got pretty lucky. I got pretty close. What it should have been was probably between six and six and a half ton. I think the bedroom unit for what I have, it works perfect. The one in the living room, I think is a little bit oversized. I think I could have gone down to about a three and a half ton and been just darn near perfect. So what am I trying to say? Do the calculation, don't do what I did get something accurate, and then go from there. All right, hopefully you've done the manual J at this point. So what's next? Well, you gotta size your actual units based off of those calculations, and then you need the ductwork, especially if it's a, a new home build. Well, remember that a geothermal heat pump actually runs at a slower speed, like the fan speeds and whatnot, so you're not gonna notice as hot of air coming out of your registers as you would typically have. So if you are building new ductwork, make sure that it's very tight and has very, very few air gaps, air leakage through it. Go through your entire system and seal that up the best way that you can. Also, you wanna design your ductwork so that each room balances correctly. You don't want to pump too much into one room and not enough into another room. And so your actual ductwork design is very, very important. There are lots of them online. If you want to do it yourself, you can do that online. But I went ahead and just had a HVAC guy do all of that for me. So I didn't even have to think about it. I think that's one of those things that if I was to do it, probably would have taken me a month to do, but it took their crew just a few days to run everything throughout my house. Money well spent. And honestly, that labor for it was 6,150 bucks. Now that you've sized your system, you're probably gonna to wanna to start figuring out what the actual system is going to be. And there's lots of them out there and there are DIY kits out there and that's not a bad thing to do. I went to a local supplier here in Wichita, Kansas, and it was key equipment. And I was able to get everything from them and they actually helped me size everything, including the loops 
that I needed for this. And when I'm talking about the loops, I'm talking about the loops that get buried in the ground. They are very familiar with the ground in this area. I dug a test hole and of course it's all clay, very saturated clay. And so I have a very good thermal conductivity of my soil. So I was able to give them that information and then they basically just gave me the entire kit, including all of the lines. And with that said, my lines are all HDPE, but uh, great resource if you're wondering either about installation or kind of design on this is the International Ground Source Heat Pump Association and I have a link in my description I think it's a great thing for you guys to research before you decide to do any of this lots of great information in there you can either use HDPE or you can use PEX A if you're not sure what kind of soil you have number one you're definitely going to want to do some sort of a test hole I'm an engineer so I kind of know what I'm looking at but at the same time you can take soil samples and send them out to a geotechnical engineer and they will do all of the lab tests to tell you exactly what you have they'll tell you the moisture content as well as the soil composition and those are two very important things the more moist it is the better thermal conductivity you have and of course the type of soil does matter somewhat but again if it's very moist even sand that's very very moist or saturated has great thermal conductivity so it's very dependent upon what you're doing with that said the deeper you go in the earth the more consistent the moisture content is down below and it's more likely to have a higher moisture content so again that's why i'd be an advocate of going deeper as you can see from this photo right here i dug 24 inch wide trenches because that was the excavator that i own it has a 24 inch bucket and i did it 10 feet deep and yep, you're gonna look at that and you're gonna say, oh my gosh, that's an OSHA violation if I've ever seen one. Well, OSHA doesn't have any jurisdiction over a guy's personal residence, but regardless, you should still follow their guidelines. Definitely want some sort of trench shoring or a trench box or benching be safe with this or if you're going to do it like what i did you shouldn't have to get into the trench you should never get into the trench it can kill you so with that said i made a slinky loop up top and then i was able to actually drop it into the hole and then cover everything back up and if you're wondering how do i design a slinky loop again it's very dependent upon the soils and the moisture content that you have and that dictates how long your pipes are going to be. So my situation was a very, very standard situation. So I got 600 foot length pipes per ton. And everything that I read at the time suggested that I needed 240 square feet of uh, basically ground surface area to lay my slinky loops on. So I had a two foot wide bucket, which meant that I made it 120 feet long. Regardless, you should design your slinky loop based on your soil type as well as the moisture content. But there is actually a book out there. It was written quite a long time ago and I don't think it's in print anymore, but I was able to find a few copies on Amazon. So it's called The Closed Loop Geothermal Systems Slinky Installation Guide. And I have a link down below in the description if you want to pick one of those up. If you're doing just a regular horizontal system, not a slinky loop system, and it calls for 600 feet of pipe, you're just going to probably dig a 300 foot long trench, run it out all the way back, and then you're good to go. Just remember that it's really more about surface area. You don't want to thermally saturate an area. So you don't want to put too many pipes or too much, too tight of a slinky in one certain area. So when in doubt, lengthen everything. If you're not sure, you don't think 600 feet is going to do it, do 800, do 1,000 feet. The pipe is really inexpensive and it's HDPE or PEX-A, like I said before, and you can get them in various lengths depending on your situation. So when in doubt, go longer than you need to. It's perfectly fine. You're definitely not going to hurt your efficiency. It does cost a little bit more. So again, this is one of those things that if you're not sure on the loops and uh, the design of it exactly, you can hire an engineer to do it. It costs money, but they're going to tell you exactly what you need to do and you have zero waste at that point. It's kind of a cost effectiveness ratio here. Is it worth 
hiring the engineer to do it versus making it a little longer than what you think it needs to be. We are standing outside where the loops are for my three ton unit. So there's a loop that actually goes out this way, another one out this way, and another one out that way. And as you can tell, you can't see anything. The grass isn't dead, it's just dormant. It is winter right at the moment. But as you can see, you can't see anything. There is no problem with growth or trees or, or anything like that, grant you. You don't necessarily want to put trees on top of them. Quick tip, when you do bury your lines and then you backfill, you're not going to have very good compaction unless you mechanically compact in say six inch layers, which most people aren't going to do. So what you do is you actually fill the lines just completely full of water and it will compact all of that dirt and form everything right around that uh, pipe and you're not going to have to worry about sediment later on. The last thing I want to talk about are the actual components themselves, the HVAC unit and everything that goes with it. Choose good quality stuff. If you're doing it yourself, and even if you weren't, I would still suggest a variable speed fan within your package unit and a two-speed compressor. And the reason is uh, you're gonna be sized based off of the extremes. The, the, the unit is gonna be sized based off the extremes. So if you have a two-stage compressor, it's actually gonna run slower than what it would normally. And if you live in a place like I do, which is very humid, you need time to take out that humidity out of the air. In a unit that comes on full blast and then shuts off after a fairly short period of time, doesn't pull out much moisture. And again, this is also one of the things you wanna get your heat loading, everything correct, because you don't wanna short cycle your units. It's gonna kill that compressor, and that compressor is extremely expensive. So get the sizing correct. And if you have the sizing a little bit off, having that two-stage compressor is kind of your saving grace. If it's running in its first stage, it's gonna be running at roughly 60% of its capacity. So it's gonna act like a smaller tonnage unit, and that's not a bad thing. That actually can make up for some mistakes along the way. Obviously, variable speed fans and two-stage compressors do add to the cost of the unit, but I still say it's worth it. Here's my system. This is the Bosch unit. This one is the four-ton unit. Unit. As you can see down here, it has a condensate line that goes over to a drain just right over here. Of course, electrical all going up. And then it flows upwards like this, and this is the return air. So everything goes back through and up like this. That is an aftermarket air filter, and I could have used the one that was uh, attached to this, or that actually came with this unit, but uh, my installers thought that this would be a much better unit. Here's the air filter system that I have, UltraVision, and it actually uses air bear filters. Here's the air filter that I use, been working great so far, and they aren't too terribly expensive. We've been able to get them, of course we have accounts at different uh, HVAC places, so we've been able to get them for 10, 12 bucks a piece, but normally a person can get it for 20, 25 bucks. Here's my flow center. It is a GT flow center. This one actually has two pumps on it. There's a pump, there's a pump, and it's all one system there. And it's a non-pressurized pump. I definitely suggest something like this. As you can see here, I have all of my pipes coming in. Made my own little manifold that comes up, goes into this, and then gets pumped all the way over into the unit right there goes through the heat exchanger in there, comes right back out, over to this side, and then right on out. You wanna make sure that the top of your flow center is the highest point, so that if there is any air that is trapped in your system, you have a way to purge it out. And of course, if you don't wanna make your own manifold system like I did with a whole bunch of little fittings, here is one that you can buy from a company. It costs a fair amount of money, but it's an all-in-one thing and has its own shutoff valves as well. So once again, it is possible to do this yourself, at least certain components of it. Know your strengths, know your weaknesses, and know where you can actually make up the money. I have an excavator myself, so I didn't have to actually pay for that. But I did have to rent an excavator whenever I was building my house 
and it cost me roughly a thousand dollars per week to do that so it took me a day for each line that I did so seven days of having that excavator I could have done it for that week. It only would have cost me that thousand bucks to get that excavator. Or if you want to use a bigger excavator, which isn't a bad idea, you could definitely do that. It costs a little bit more, but you may have it for less time. It's gonna save you time in the long run, and that's always a good thing. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure to hit that like button as well as subscribe. I'll see you next time.